Year 12s, listen up. I'm going to be doing the AS sample assessment materials from Edexcel. So the vast majority of you will never actually have to sit this exam. So you might be like, well, Paddy, what's the point in doing a past paper on it? Because here's the thing, right? You'll do your A-level exams at the end of year 13. You don't necessarily have to do the AS at the end of year 12. But that does not mean that these papers are not <laughs> madly useful. Here's the thing, right? On YouTube, I do a load of past paper videos because they're a very, very useful way of practicing for the exam. But obviously the year 12s can't really look at them because they're just full of year 13 content. But that doesn't mean that they need to be left out because here's the thing, you should really be doing past papers throughout your whole A-level and maths, including year 12. So wouldn't it be great if there was a paper that just had year 12 content on there? Well, there is, and it is this. So this one is paper one, and it is just pure mathematics. So here's the thing, even if you're maybe midway through year 12, you've not yet started applied, you know, your mechanics and stats, but you've done the pure, you can do this paper. And I think that you should be doing past papers and getting used to kind of how the exam works as quickly as humanly possible. So that is why this is a fantastic thing to get started on. So if you've done your pure, or maybe even if you've done most of it, give the paper a go and then watch this video because you're gonna see, okay, this is kind of how A-level exams work. Get that in early. Even if you're in year 13, right? Like if you, you know, you're halfway through year 13 or at the start and you're like, oh, I just wanna make sure that all of my year 12 is still pretty solid before I get cracking on with this horrible stuff. Do the paper, have a look at the solutions. It's gonna be very, very useful to you. So we've got paper one. Without further ado, let's give it a go. So it says the line L passes through the points A, 3, 1, and B, 4, minus 2. So we've got these dos puntos aquí. Find an equation for L. Okay, so I am a fan of y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. Now, look, if you use y equals mx plus c, I'm not going to judge you. I prefer this because you can easily say, oh, I've got a gradient and a point. This is the formula. I think it's a bit quicker. So what is x1 and y1 in this case? Well, it's either this or this. It doesn't matter. Why don't we call it this? What is m? Well, m is going to be the gradient, isn't it? So gradient is changing y over change in x, which is going to be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So let's work that out first, then stick it all in. So y2 is going to be minus 2 minus y1, which is 1, over x2, which is 4, easy stuff, right? Minus x1, which is 3. Minus 2 minus 1 is going to be minus 3. 4 minus 3 is going to be 1. So that's just going to be minus 3. Straight in, right? This is why I prefer this one. So straight in, so what am I going to get? I'm going to get y minus, and then y1 I'm taking as 1, equals m, which is minus 3, times x minus x1, which is Simplify it. We like, we like simplifying. So if I was to multiply this bracket out, I'm going to get minus 3x and then minus 3 times minus 3 is positive 9. And then what have I got? What have I got? Let's add this 1 because this 1 can kind of collect with this constant term here. So I'm going to get y equals minus 3x plus 10. And I reckon that is a more than fantastic way of representing my answer there. Question two says the curve C has equation y equals 2x squared minus 12x plus 16. Find the gradient of the curve at the point 5, 6. Okay, well, it's a curve, isn't it? So to get the gradient, we need to differentiate. Gradients are straight lines. You can do what we did in the last question. As soon as we've got a curve, you know, there's like a quadratic term or a cubic or something, then we're going to be differentiating. So dy by dx, in this case, is going to be what? So 2x squared, I need to bring the power down and then I need to take one from the power. So I've got a two and then I'm multiplying it by that power of two, so I'm gonna get four, bring the power down, so I'm gonna get x to the one or x. And then minus 12x is gonna to go to minus 12. Plus 16 is gonna be gone. So this is pretty quick because basically this is my gradient function and then at the point P, which has x coordinate five, dy by dx is going to equal this thing with five subbed in x. Easy as that, right? So four multiplied by five minus 12. You don't even need the y coordinate here. Four times five is 20 minus 12. I get eight. Done. 
Question three, I love that bit at the start where you're just hammering him. So given the point A as position vector 3i minus 7j, B as the position vector 8i plus 3j, find the vector AB. So any vector, right, if I have AB, if I want AB, I just do B minus A. Okay, so I can either express this as a column vector, but because they're going with I's and J's here, I is basically how far along horizontally, J is vertically, I'm going to keep it in their way, okay? So it's just going to be 8i plus 3j and then minus a. So that's going to be 3i minus 7j. And then just clean it up. So how many i's do I have? I have 8i minus 3i, so 5i's. I still wrote 8. <laughs> one of them days, and then j's, I've got 3j minus minus 7j. So that's 3j plus 7j, or 10j. And yeah, I'll say b, I'll say b. Um, now, what does this mean? What are these lines? These lines are kind of the modulus, or the size, or the magnitude of this. So what would that mean? Well, a vector of 5i plus 10j essentially looks like this, right? It's basically saying, look, go 5 in the horizontal direction, go 10 upwards. So the kind of resultant or magnitude or size of this vector is effectively just this, isn't it? It's saying, you know, if I do that and that, what's the size? How far have I traveled? Well, you've done that. So what's that distance? How are we going to get this? We use a bit of geometry. I believe we would use Pythagoras in this case. So this is just going to be the square root of 5 squared plus 10 squared. 5 squared is 25. 10 squared is 100, so it's going to be the square root of 125. That probably simplifies to something nice. I'm not going to try and impress you because I'm allowed my calculator. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to reinforce trying to do stuff in your head to look cool. Use your calculator, yeah. That's 5 root 5. And that's question 3. Question 4. f of x equals all of that grim stuff there. A. Use the factor theorem to show that x minus 3 is a factor of f of x. Well, if you are got your AI tutor account, you will know that if f of 3 is 0, then x minus 3 is a factor. So all we need to do is work out what f of 3 is. So 4 multiplied by 3 cubed minus 12 multiplied by 3 squared plus 2 multiplied by 3 minus 6, which is going to equal, let's have a look, 4 times 3 cubed minus 12 times 3 squared plus 2 times 3 minus 6 is 0. Who would have thought? Therefore, x minus 3 is a factor. Capitals, because I'm shouting. Partly, hence show that 3 is the only real root of the equation f of x equals 0. Okay, so if x minus 3 is a factor, that means that this cubic f of x can be expressed as x minus 3 multiplied by something. Now, if we found out that something, it would be great because we could say, okay, well, therefore, x minus 3 times m mm is going to be 0. And then I would get my solutions from either saying x minus 3 equals 0 or this something equals 0. But before we do any of that, we need this something, don't we? I am going to do algebraic long division to get that something, okay? So, here's what I need to do. This something is going to be f of x divided by x minus 3. So, how am I going to do this? I'm going to write x minus 3 outside here. And then I'm going to do the old, the old job here. And then I'm just going to stick the cubic inside here. 4x cubed minus 12x squared. I'm not going to teach you this if, as if it was the first time you're teaching it. I'm just going to go through it. So, you might want another video if you've never seen this before. But... I'm going to see how many times x goes into 4x cubed, it would be 4x squared. I'm then going to multiply this through, so I'm going to get 4x squared times x is 4x cubed. 4x squared times minus 3 is going to be minus 12x squared. Take all of that away from each other, and it's exactly the same thing, so it goes. So here, I would just be left with, well, this 2x minus 6. Rinse and repeat. How many times does x go into 2x? It goes in twice. Multiply the 2 by the x, 2x. Multiply the 2 by the minus 3, minus 6. And this is good. If all of this cancels to 0, you've got no remainder, which you shouldn't get, and it's worked. In other words, this thing here is 4x squared plus 2. 
So now imagine I was to solve this equation f of x equals zero. And I get to this point and I'm all good. And then I say, okay, what do I do now? Well, that would lead me to believe that either x minus three equals zero, which would imply that x equals three is a solution, cool. Or four x squared plus two equals zero. And what I'm asked to show is that the only real solution is this. In other words, that this equation does not give me any solutions. And how am I gonna do that? I'll, I'll give you two options. The first one is I can just try and solve it, right? So divide by two. So what's that gonna get me? That's gonna get me two x squared plus one equals zero. Take the one over to the other side, right? That's how you'd solve this. You'd get two x squared equals minus one. Divide both sides by two, I'd get x squared equals minus a half. And how would I get x? I'd square root both sides, so I would say x equals plus minus the square root of minus a half. And then I go, wait a minute, I can't square root negative numbers. Or should I say, I can't square root negative numbers and get real answers. It's not possible. There was no real number that satisfies this. So there I could say, you know, no solutions to this. Or I could be clever and use the discriminant here because this is a quadratic and without even having to try and work out the solutions. So tell you what, let's box this. This, this is your option one, yeah, this is your option one. And then your option two is gonna be use the discriminant on this. So I'm gonna say that the discriminant, which is b squared minus four ac, right? a is the coefficient of the x squared, b is the coefficient of the x, c is the number on the end. So this is gonna equal b squared, well, doesn't b is zero here because I've got zero x, so that would be zero minus four times a, which is four, times c, which is two. So this is gonna get what? Well, four times four is 16, times that by two is 32, so I'm, I've just got minus 32. Minus 32 is less than zero, and if the discriminant is less than zero, there are no real solutions to this, or no real roots, however you want to say it. So there's your option two. I'm, I'm giving you all two options, I'm too good to you. I think that's far done. Let's have a look at question five. Integration, we're warming it up. Given that f of x is all of that stuff, 2x plus 3 plus 12 over x squared show that the integral of f of x between those limits is that. All right, let's have it. So the integral of f of x is going to be what? It's going to be the integral of 2x plus 3 and then plus 12 over x squared. I am going to write this like that. Why am I going to do that? Because it's just easy to see, okay, because remember with integrals, we look at the power. We go add one to the power, all of that stuff. If I have it like this, I know what the power is, <laughs> you're right. I know that the power is minus two. So it's it, it's a lot better to do it like that, basically. And that's what they're really trying to test you on here. So I just integrate, don't I? Now, it's gonna be a definite integral because I've got these limits on. So I just gotta get cracking. I'm gonna write this down here because I feel like this is gonna get big. So with definite integrals, give me some square brackets, okay? Integrate, add one to the power. So that's gonna be two x squared divided by the new power. Add one to the power. Now, the power of x here is technically zero, right? Because it's like x to the zero is one. So if I add one to that power, well, I'd get x to the one. And then I divide by that power, and I'm dividing by one. So I would, I would just get three x, because essentially I'd have three x to the one over one, which is three x, isn't it? So that's good. And then here, what's popping off? Well, add one to the power would get me a minus one, because minus two add one is minus one. Divide by the minus one. And I've still got the 12 there, haven't I? So it's not pretty, but that's right. I don't need a plus C for definite integrals. If you don't believe me, go and do your research on it. Can't be bothered explaining it. Now, two root two, one, shove the numbers in. So I'm gonna get one bracket that corresponds to me subbing in this top limit. And I'm gonna minus the other bracket corresponding to that. So I'm gonna get, first of all, you know what? Two over two, they cancel, don't they? So I'm, going to, I'm just gonna do that. Ideally, you would have another line of work in, but I don't. Now, this is going to be what? It's going to be 2 root 2 squared plus 3 times 2 root 2. And then, again, I'm just going to simplify this a bit. I, would, I should have done it in another line, but, you know, I'm being lazy. This, the, the fact that it says 1 isn't going to change the value of this at all, but it will make it minus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this minus 1 out, and then that's just going to be minus, okay? I hope that's okay. So now I can write this a bit nicer, can't I? Because it's going to be minus 12 times by 2 root 2 to the minus 1. 
sick. And now I minus the bracket of one subbed in. So this is going to be a bit nicer because I get one squared plus three times one minus 12 times one to the minus one. Okay, what do I have here? Now, I want this to kind of be a mix of calculator and knowledge because sometimes when people just shove all of this into the calculator, they'll get like a decimal and then they'll be like, well, what do I do here? You know, the answer wants a third. So I kind of want you to know that you're allowed to use the calculator, but if you get decimals, you're going to need to use your brain a bit. So let's have a look. 2 root 2 squared, that you can do in your head, but again, I want to promote the usage of this calculator because it, it doesn't make mistakes, turns out. So 2 root 2 squared is 8. 3 times 2 root 2, you can do this in your head. The reason is I don't want a decimal here. I want this in terms of root 2. So I just do number times number. That's going to be 6 lots of root 2. This thing here, let's think about it. If that's to the minus 1, that's the same as being divided by that. So I'm going to keep it like that for now. This is going to be nice. 1 squared is 1. 3 times 1 is 3. 1 to the minus 1 is also 1. So I'll just get minus 12 there. Okay, nice. So now I can kind of see what's popping off. I've got some number terms. Let's have a think about the number term. I'm going to get 8 and then minus... Well, what's all of this? What is 1 plus 3 minus 12? It's 1 plus 3 minus 12, which is minus 8. So I get 8 minus minus 8 as the number term. And then for the thirds, I've got my 6 root 2 minus, well, 12 over 2 root 2. There's one thing I can do there, and I can cancel 2 from top and bottom. So that's just going to be 6 over root 2. And now let's start cleaning up. 8 minus minus 8 is going to be positive 16. Plus 6 root 2. I'm going to leave you there for now. This is a bit annoying because I have a third on the denominator. What do we do? We rationalize the denominator. So the way I'm going to do that is by multiplying both top and bottom of the fraction by root 2. So this is going to be minus 6 root 2 over root 2 times root 2. Okay. So why have I done that? Because root 2 times root 2 is 2, isn't it? So this is going to be minus 6 root 2 over 2. Nice. Because now what do I get? I get 60 plus 6 root 2 minus 6 divided by 2 is 3. So this is minus 3 root 2 here, leaving me with my final answer of 16 plus 6 root 2 minus 3 root 2 is 3 root 2. 6. Prove from first principles that the derivative of 3x squared is 6x. So differentiation from first principles, it actually tells it you in your formula booklet. So I think you're going to remember it, but just so you know, you don't have to. So it basically says that if we've got some function f of x, right? The derivative of that, so f prime of x, is the limit as h tends to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. I'm not going to explain this here. You know, we're doing a past paper, so <laughs> let's not worry ourselves with that. So essentially, in this case our f of x is going to be, what, 3x squared. Because then when we get our f prime of x, that's the derivative of 3x squared. So all we need to do is just sub this into this formula. So, okay, if my f of x is 3x squared, then f of x plus h is just going to be replacing the x with an x plus h in that. So it's going to be 3x plus h squared and then minus f of x, minus 3x squared, right? All over h. Okay, well, let's expand this and see what happens. So I am going to get 3 multiplied by x squared plus twice the product of this, so 2xh plus h squared, minus the 3x squared from the end, and I've still got my h down here. Clean it up a bit more what will we have? So I'm going to have 3x squared plus 6xh plus 3h squared minus 3x squared. Are we seeing anything nice happening? I hope we are because the 3x squareds are going to cancel. So that's kind of what happens with differentiation from first principles. 
you'll get a nice cancellation or something, meaning you can actually then cancel that h down. So 6xh plus 3h squared over h. I can now cancel an h from everything, can't I? Before, I couldn't do that. So what am I going to be left with? I'm going to be left with the limit as h tends to 0 of 6 x plus 3 h and now I can apply this limit at any other point if I would apply the limit I'd get 0 over 0 it doesn't work but now I can apply the limit as h tends to 0 obviously 3 h is going to tend to 0 which means that the derivative is going to be 6 x find the first three terms in ascending powers of x of the binomial expansion of 2 minus x over 2 to the 7 given each term in its simplest form it's boring this, isn't it? Just got to do it though. Right, so essentially, yeah, your first term is 2 and your second term is minus x over 2. It carries the sign as well to the 7. Now, I only need three terms, which is nice. So the first term is going to be 7c0 of 2 to the 7 and then minus x over 2 to the 0. Now, that's going to be 1 and that's going to be 1 as well. I just like to write it because it's, it's consistent. Um, I'm going to run out of space here, so I'm going to do my other terms going down here. And then basically, this number is going to go up, this is going down, this is going up. So it's going to be 7c1, 2 to the 6, minus x over 2 to the 1, plus 7c2, 2 to the 5, minus x over 2 squared. And then that's the first three terms. So plus dot 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 to show that that's not actually equal to that, it's equal to all of it. And then simplify, right? So this 7c0 is going to be 1, basically. But I'll show you. So 7c0 is 1. And then 2 to the 7 is going to be 128. Minus x over 2 to the 0 is 1. So the first term is 128. Second term is going to be 7c1, which is going to be 7, multiplied by 2 to the power of 6, which is 448. And then that's going to be multiplied by minus x over 2. Third term is going to be 7c2. I'll write all of this down. So I'm going to get 7c2, which is 21, multiplied by 2 to the 5, which is 32, multiplied by minus x over 2 squared. Well, what's going to happen here? The minus is going to be minus 1 squared, makes it a positive. x squared is x squared. And then 2 squared is 4, so it's going to be multiplied by positive x squared over 4. And then the dot, dot, dot. Okay, let's simplify. I get 128 plus, well, not plus, actually, not plus, because this is going to make it a minus 448 over 2, which is 224. So this is minus 224x. 21 times 32 times x squared over 4. Work out the number here. So do 21 times 32 multiplied by 1 over 4, and then that's how many x squareds have you got. So that's going to be 168. So 168 x squared, and then plus dot, dot, dot. That's your first three terms. Explain how you would use your expansion to give an estimate for the value of 1.995 to the 7. Well, what is the difference between what we've done and 1.995 to the 7? Well, we've got a bracket, we've got a power of 7, and then the only difference that is that instead of 2 minus x over 2, we have 1.995. So surely I could use that if 2 minus x over 2 was equal to 1.995, right? So what x value is this going to hold for? Well, let's work it out. So if I add x over 2 to both sides, I'm going to get 2 equals 1.995 plus x over 2. If I take this over 1.995 equals x over 2, and then if I multiply by 2, I'm going to get x as 2 multiplied by 2 minus 1.995. What's that going to equal? Well, 2 minus 2 times 2 minus 1.995 is going to be 0 0.01, okay? What's that telling me? It's basically telling me that, look, if I sub in x equals 0 0.001 into this expansion, that is going to be, the left-hand side is going to be the same as 1.995 to the power of 7. 
In other words, to, you know, to get an estimate of 1.9 and 5 to the 7, all I would do is sub in x equals 0 0.001, 0 0.01, <laughs> so many zeros, man. Sub in x equals 0 0.01 into the expansion. That's it. And that would get you an estimate, an estimate because it's, um, it's not the full expansion, but it would get you an estimate of 1.995 to the 7. A triangular lawn is modelled by the triangle ABC shown in figure 1. The length AB is to be 30 metres long, BAC is 70, ABC is 60. Okay, so in other words, the diagram. Calculate the area of the lawn to three significant figures. Here's what I'd do. I'd get the diagram up. And I would say, okay, well, I've kind of got A, B, C. Now, the area of a triangle is generally a half A, B sine C, okay? Now, they've written A, B, C here, but I can label them however I want. For example, I could say, you know what? No, I want, I want this to be C. I'm, I'm allowed to do that. I can do what I want, All right? So the reason I've done that is because I've already got this angle. And then basically, the A, B are going to be the sides enclosing that angle. In other words this would be my A, and then my B would be this. So look, the A, B enclose this angle C. So I'm almost there, but I've not got this B. If I had B, I could go straight to this formula, right? So how can I get B? I can use the sine rule, B. If I had B, I could sine rule. If I have a length and an opposing angle, I can use that to work out other things. So I don't actually have a length and an opposing angle quite yet, do I? But I could easily get this angle, and that's opposing this length of 30. So how do I get that angle? Well, triangles add up to get 180. I'm currently moving my calculator from radians to degrees, by the way. You are in year 12, so you might not know what a radian is, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so, okay. So basically, if I was to get this, I would just do 180 minus 70 minus 60, which is going to get me 50. So this is 50, which allows me to use the sine rule because it tells me that a over sine a is going to be equal to b over sine b. And this is useful because I got this, got this, got this, and I want this. So putting that in, what am I going to get? I'm going to get 30 over sine a, which is 50, is equal to b, which is my unknown, over sine b, sine 60. So that tells me that b, my unknown in this case, I need to multiply up by sine 60. So I'm going to get 30 sine 60 all over sine 50, which is going to get me what? 30 sine 60 over sine 50 gives me 33.91547 dot dot dot. I want this not to be rounded because I'm going to use it in a future calculation. So don't round it. I've actually got it stored as ants on my calculator at the moment. I want that. Okay, I'm now going to go to the area. So this is going to tell me that the area is therefore equal to a half times A, which is 30, times B, which is all of this stuff, the 33.91547 dot dot dot, but I'll just use ants on my calculator for it, times sine C, so sine 70. And this is going to get me what? I'm going to do a half. Multiplied by 30, multiplied by amps, which gives me all that accuracy, multiplied by sine 70, giving me 478. It's a big old lawn. Multiplied by 05184 dot dot dot. Three significant figures is going to be 478. And the unit is going to be meters squared. Fantastic. Part B says, why is your answer unlikely to be accurate to the nearest square meter? Uh, I suppose I'd think about the context of the question here. And I would say, well, okay, well, this is a lawn. And it, right, it's, it's a lawn with an area of 478 meters squared. So a pretty big lawn. So imagine there was a little bump on this lawn. Or imagine there was a little kind of slope going down. Or imagine something, right? You know, it's, here's the thing, right? 
If this lawn was completely flat, dead flat, I am talking perfectly flat, then the maths we did here would apply, wouldn't it? Because the maths we did here is on a triangle, it's on a 2D shape. As soon as I have a lawn that maybe curves slightly, goes up, has a little hill in the middle, the area is not going to be the same, is it? Because we've not accounted for that in the maths that we've just done. This maths has assumed it is a completely flat plane, right? But what's the actual chance of that happening in real life? Find me a lawn, 478 square meters, that is just mathematically perfectly flat. It's probably quite unlikely. So look, I'll just say, look, lawn unlikely, lune, unlikely to be perfectly flat. I think the examiner would give me the mark for that one. Sweet. Question nine, solve for, that's a bit of a mad range, x from 360 to 540, so that, that's probably gonna catch some people out, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. 12 sine squared x plus seven cos x minus 13 equals zero, giving your answers to one decimal place. All right, so it's a trig equation. The problem with this equation is that I've got some sines and some coses. It's quite hard for me to solve an equation that's mixed up of different trig functions. However, if I was to use some kind of trig identity to get this equation just in terms of sine or just in terms of cos or whatever it happens to be, then I can probably solve for that trig function. Let me show you what I mean. I know that sine squared x plus cos squared x, no matter the value of x, is one. Okay, so that means that if I ever have a cos squared, I can swap it with a one minus sine squared and vice versa. So the question is, right, I've got a sine squared here, what can I do with it? Given that I've already got this seven cos x, it'd be pretty useful if I swap that sine squared into a cos squared, because then I'm gonna have an equation just as a function of cos. So instead of 12 sine squared x, I'm gonna write the following, 12, one minus cos squared x. And then let's write the rest of the equation, so plus seven x, not seven x, seven cos x, minus 13, equals zero. Simplify it. 12 minus 12 cos squared x plus 7 cos x minus 13 equals zero. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get everything onto the other side. So I'm going to get positive 12 cos squared x. I'm going to take this from both sides. And then, well, what do I have? I've got 12 minus 13, which is minus 1. But then I add one, don't I, to both sides to get this. Sweet, okay, so why have I done this? Because, so I don't go through this every time, but just to explain the method here, imagine I was to say this, let's, let's make up a y, yeah? I'm gonna call that y cos, cos x. What's gonna happen? Well then this equation is gonna become 12y squared minus seven y plus one, equals zero, which is just the quadratic which we know how to solve, right? So there's loads of things you can do. If you want to use your calculator, that's completely fine. Quadratic formula, that's completely fine. I'm feeling bold. I'm going to try and factorize this because I think I'm seeing that if I had 3y and a 4y, and then I had a minus 1 and a minus 1, that works. <laughs> but don't worry, you know, use your calculator. I don't care, I don't care. There's no marks for factorizing this, okay? It gives me two solutions. It gives me that either y is a third or that y is a quarter. Now, why is this useful? I'm now going to undo this transformation because that then tells me that then cos x is equal to a third or cos x is equal to a quarter. Now, this is the bit where we need to be careful. We can't just straight away, willy-nilly, inverse cos on our calculator, done. The reason is, look at the range we have here. So I wanna kinda of draw the cos graph to really show you what's popping off. Right, the cos graph, this is gonna be ugly, just, just bear with me. It does this, and its period is 360. So this is gonna be 360. And then 540 is an extra 180 from that. So I've got another like half period here. So if this is 360, essentially it's gonna go down like that to 540, okay? Go up again 720, but, but this, is my, this is my range here. So if I was to kind of just actually show you where my range is, it's greater than or equal to 360, so basically here, and then it's 
less than 540. So it's just less than this. So I'm looking for solutions in between these red lines. Now, now is the time where I can say, okay, what do I do? Well, the solutions of cos x equals a third are going to be when the line cos x intersects the line a third. So that's going to be all of these places, but the only one that I care about is this one. So I know I'm going to get a solution from that. Let's get that first and then we'll do the quarter one. So at this point, I say, okay, now I can go inverse cos of my calculator. So if I was to do the inverse cos of a third on my calculator, making sure I'm in degrees, but you probably don't have to worry about that because you might not have learned about radians yet. I am going to get 70.528 dot dot dot. Again, I'm doing the rounding thing. My calculator has just given me this solution here. This is the 70 dot dot dot. Given that I have that, how do I get that? Well, look at the symmetries here. This chunk is exactly the same as this chunk. And that starts at 360. So if I was to do 360 plus the 70 point, blah, 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 I get the solution I'm after. So my first solution is going to be 360 plus that stuff, blah, 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 which is going to be what? 360 plus ants. And it says giving your answers to one decimal place. So this one to one decimal place is going to be 430.5. That's my first solution. And I'll do the same thing with a quarter. So what happens? I say, okay, well, when is cos x going to be equal to a quarter? That is going to correspond to a line kind of down here, right? So what do I do? It's going to intersect here. Uh, and it's the same thing. So I need to do the inverse cos of a quarter. Let's work that out. So inverse cos of a quarter is 75.5 dot, 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 dot. Keep your accuracy in your calculator. And then it's the same thing. If I do 360 plus that, that's going to be the answer that I care about. So my second value of x here is going to be 360 plus ants, which is 435.5, which rounded to one decimal place is going to be 435.5. So my two answers are 430.5, 435. The equation kx squared plus 4kx plus 3 equals 0, where k is a constant, has no real values. Prove that k is greater than or equal to 0 and less than 3 over 4. So, anytime it's talking about real roots or repeated roots or no real roots, discriminant. It's discriminant, right? So, if we have a quadratic ax squared plus bx plus c, then the discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. So, here's the thing. In our case, for this quadratic in the question, my value of a is k, my value of b is 4k, and my value of c is 3. So I can work out the discriminant here, can't I? The discriminant in this case would be b squared, so it's going to be 4k squared, minus 4a, which is k, times c, which is 3. And because this has no real roots, we know that the discriminant should be less than 0. So we've got an inequality. So let's clean it up. So what do we get? We're going to get 16k squared minus 12k is less than 0. Okay, so let's get the critical values here. So if I was to factorise k out of this, I would get k, 16k minus 12. And then just to get the critical values, this would be equal to zero. So I'll write CVs here, let them know that I'm not solving, I'm just getting the critical values. So this would lead to K is zero or K is 12 over 16, which simplifies, doesn't it? If I divide top and bottom by four, I'm gonna get three over four. Okay, so if I was to sketch this thing here, super quick sketch of 16K squared minus 12K, it would be a positive quadratic and it would hit the x-axis and 0 and 3 over 4. So it looked like that. That's supposed to go through the origin. You, you get what I mean. So here's the thing. When is this less than 0? When is this underneath the x-axis? Well, it's for k 
greater than zero and less than three over four, because all of the values between not and three over four, this thing is underneath the x-axis or less than zero. Now this isn't the answer, is it? We want this to be the answer, but I can't just say that, like I need some mathematical reason because all of this discriminant logic has only led me to this conclusion. I also need to show that for this thing, for this thing to have no real roots, k could also be zero. Well, let's think about it. If k was zero in this equation, right, what would that imply? Well, I would get zero x squared plus four times zero times x plus three equals zero. Well, that goes and that goes. So this would simplify to three equals zero, which is not true, obviously, right? So here's the thing. K equals zero. This equation is false, so it has no solutions, right? This has no real roots, obviously. There is no number for k that satisfies 3 equals 0. So what it's saying here is that, yes, k being between 0 and 3 quarters would give no real roots. You know, we use the discriminant to show that. But also, if k was 0, we wouldn't get real roots either. So in other words, if k was between the 0 and 3 over 4 or 0, then we have no real roots. 11. Prove that for all positive values of x and y, that thing there. So when you're trying to prove inequalities, something that you really want here is you're looking for squared numbers being greater than zero. <laughs> so essentially, it's really hard to prove this inequality like this. But if I did some algebra to it and got everything over to one side, I hope that I will get like some squared number is greater than zero. And then we can say, well, yeah, that is true because square numbers have to be greater than zero or greater than or equal to zero. I'll show you what I mean. So I currently have the square root of x, y is less than or equal to x plus y over two. There is absolutely nothing useful I can do here <laughs> at this point, right? I can't really come to any conclusion like this. But if I was to say square both sides, so if I was to uh, square the left-hand side, I would get x, y. And then if I was to square this, I would get x plus y over 2 all squared. Now, a quick note here. I'm allowed to square both sides here because this says for all positive values of x and y. Meaning that the left-hand side is positive and the right-hand side is positive. If that wasn't the case, I wouldn't be allowed to square them here. Let me give you an example. I know that three is greater than minus four. That's true, isn't it? Three is a bigger number than minus four, okay? So let me square both sides. So I would say three squared is nine, minus four squared is 16. So I would get nine is greater than 16. Well, that's clearly wrong, isn't it? So what's happened? <laughs> the fact that one of the sides was negative, meant that when I squared it, I was actually multiplying by a negative, which means I would have had to have flipped the inequality. So the reason I'm allowed to do it here is because I know that both the left and the right-hand side are positive. So when I square them, I'm not multiplying by a negative and I don't need to flip the inequality. So that is why it has that positive values of X and Y, I think, here. It's the thing that allows me to do that. And I actually suspect that part B is going to be something to do with the fact that when they're negative, the story's a bit different. So I'm allowed to do that. Cool. <laughs> what now? So why don't I clean this up a bit and then see what we can do? So this thing on the right is going to be equal to what? x squared plus 2xy plus y squared all over 4. I'm now going to multiply both left and right by 4. So I'm going to get 4xy is less than or equal to x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. I'm now going to take this 4xy over to the right-hand side. So I'm going to get 0, less than or equal to x squared. And then I've got minus 2xy now, because I've got 2xy minus 4xy plus y squared. Now this is interesting. Remember what I was saying about a square number? If you're a bit clever with your algebra here, you will realize that this thing here is actually x minus y all squared because I get the x squared and then twice the product of the terms, right? So 2xy minus 2xy and then the y squared. So that's that. 
And then what this is saying is, look, x minus y squared is greater than or equal to zero. And we know that that is true because I have a square number, right? So this is true because square numbers are always greater than or equal to zero, aren't they? There is no way, even if x minus y is, is negative, when I square it, it's going to be positive. So that is why this thing is true. So here's the thing. It's easy to show that this is true, hard to show that that is true. So that's why we need to simplify it, get it onto one side, get yourself a square number, and I promise it's going to work out. So now part B, look, prove by counter example that this is not true when x and y are both negative. So luckily, it's only one mark, and I just need a counter example here. So I don't need to fully go into all of the logic. But essentially, all I need really is if I can find an x value and a y value, one example, that's all I need, one example, where this doesn't hold, then I'm good here. So what if x was minus 1? And what if y was minus 1? Why not? If x is minus 1 and y is minus 1, then the square root of xy is going to equal the square root of minus 1 times minus 1, which is the square root of 1, which is 1. So that's the left-hand side. The right-hand side will equal minus 1 plus minus 1 over 2, which is minus 2 over 2, which is minus 1. So here's the thing. In this case, the left-hand side is greater than the right-hand side, isn't it? Therefore, not true when x and y are negative. So technically, that didn't show that it's always not true when x and y are negative. It's basically showing that there is a case where x and y is negative where this thing isn't true. And that is all you need for part B. They're just asking for that counterexample. A student was asked to give the exact solution to the equation. 2 to the 2x plus 4 minus 9 to the 2x equals 0. The student attempt is shown below and we need to identify some errors. So let's have a look. 2 to the 2x plus 4 minus 9 to the 2x equals 0. Okay, well, I've just written out, so nothing crazy there. 2 to the 2x plus... Oh! Oh! This student clearly didn't have an eye tutor. What is this, man? This is unacceptable. They've said that 2 to the 2x plus 4 is the same as 2 to the 2x plus 2 to the 4. Come on, come on, man. You're better than that. So that's clearly the first error. Look, oh, come on. 2 to the 2x plus 4 is definitely not equal to 2 to the 2x plus 2 to the 4. Why is that? Because the correct way to do this would be that 2 to the 2x plus 4 is actually equal to 2 to the 2x multiplied by 2 to the 4. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Right, let's carry on. So they then say let 2 to the x equals y. Cool. They then say that y squared, okay, because that would be the 2 to the 2x, minus 9y, which is the minus 9 times 2 to the x, that's okay, plus 8, oh, oh, plus 8. Mate, this is tragic, this is tragic. They're saying that 2 to the 4 is equal to 8. 2 to the 4 is not equal to 8, is it? 2 to the 4 is equal to 60. Come on, man. Come on, man. They're the two mistakes. Unbelievable. But you are watching this video, so you ain't going to make them, are you? So, um, yeah, they're the two errors. And then it's obviously just ridiculous from them. I mean, but we want to find the exact solution. So we're going to do it right. Yeah. We're going to be the AI tutor subscriber that does this correctly. So here we go. We're going to start with 2 to the 2x plus 4. Minus 9 times... 2 to the x. Wonky brackets. That's what we're here for. All right. So, well, I've just told you that this thing here should actually be 2 to the 2x times 2 to the 4. So let's do that. And then minus 9 times 2 to the x. That's cool. Equals 0. And let's copy them. Let's let y equals 2 to the x. That was the best thing that they did. So if that is the case, then 2 to the 2x is 2, 2 to the x all squared, so that would be y squared. And then this, as we know, is 16. And then minus 9, this is just going to be y now, equals 0. And what do we have here? We have a quadratic that we can take a y out of. So I'm going to get y. 
16y minus 9 equals 0. So therefore, y equals 0 or 16y minus 9 equals 0. This would get me y equals 9 over 16. Am I done? Not quite, because y is equal to 2 to the x, isn't it? So we therefore have either 2 to the x equals 0 or 2 to the x equals 9 over 16. So is there a value of x that gives such that 2 to the x equals 0? There's actually not. So this has no solutions. Basically, as x goes to minus infinity, this goes towards 0, but it's not an exact solution. Like, it's never equal to 0. And then how would I solve this thing over here? I would probably, probably have to use some logs, right? Find the exact solution. So I don't need my calculator. I can just write this as a log. Essentially, x is basically the power I need to raise 2 to to get 9 over 16. In other words, x is log to the base 2 of 9 over 16. And that's exact. I can put that into my calculator, but it's going to get me some you know horrible number that I need to round. That's the exact solution. So that's completely fine. Factorize completely, x cubed plus 10x squared plus 25x. Okay, so I mean, the first thing is there's a common factor of x here, isn't there? So that would be x multiplied by x squared plus 10x plus 25. And then hopefully I can factorize the thing inside it. So what's it going to be? It's going to be x, and then I'm going to get an x, and then an x. Technically, I don't need these extra brackets here. And then, will what two numbers add to 10 and multiply to 25? It's actually going to be 5 and 5, isn't it? So the nicest way would be x multiplied by x plus 5 all squared. Sick. Sketch it. All right. So obviously, the fact that we factorized it in part A is going to help. Because if we have y equals x times x plus 5 squared, well, first of all, I know that when y is 0, then I've got two x values. I could either have x is 0 or x is minus 5 from setting both of those things equal 0. And at minus 5, I have this repeated root. So that kind of, basically, I get this, um, I get like a stationary point at that. So it just touches it and turns around at that point. And then also, when x is 0, y is 0, right? So the only time it's going to hit the y axis is at 0. Now, let's have a look. Let's get some lovely little axes on the go. So there's really a couple of things that I need here. I need the fact that it hits at 0. The fact that it hits at minus 5 and has this kind of turning point at minus 5. And then the fact that it's a positive cubic. It's going to start one here and go up here. So with all of those pieces of information, it's pretty easy because I go here. I know it's going to turn here because it's this repeated root. And then it's going to have to turn at some point here. And then it is going to go through the origin and it is going to go up on forever. This is minus 5. I don't need to label that because it's the origin. It's implicit that it's going to be 0. And then I'm pretty sweet. And it says showing the coordinates of the point at which it curve cuts or touches the x-axis. So I've done that. And then it doesn't luckily ask me to find the coordinates of the turning point. So, you know, because it's explicitly told me to show where it needs to hit the axis, that means that if it did want me to find this point, it would have explicitly told me that as well. So that's fine. Part C says find the two, oh no wait. It says the point of the coordinates minus three zero lies on the curve of the equation that, where it is constant. Find the two possible values of it. Nice. All right. So what's going on here? What's going on here? Like, what is the difference, first of all, with this function that we've just been given in part C and then the normal function? We have the graph here of y equals x cubed plus 10x plus 25x. So in other words, you know, this here is the graph of y equals f of x, right? The only difference between what we have here and what they have in part C is that they have swapped the x with an x plus a. So what they have is a y equals f of x plus a, don't they? It's the same function, but instead of x inside it, they have x plus a. So what does that correspond to graphically? Well, it turns out that if I have 
f of x plus a, it corresponds just to a horizontal shift. So nothing happens to the y values, nothing happens to the shape, it doesn't get stretched or anything, it's just a horizontal translation. So it could be going this way, it could be going this way. So what's it saying? It's saying that the point of the coordinates minus three zero lies on this curve. So given that the y values don't change, there's only two possible things that could have happened here. The first one is that this minus five point got shifted over here, where this is now minus three. So that's the first option. And let's talk about that first of all. I'm trying to get it so that the point is just on the axis, perfect. So what would have had to have happened for this to be the case? Well, it would have had to have gone to the right by two. Now you do also need to remember one other bit of knowledge here, and that is that if I have this, this corresponds to a translation by the vector, not positive a, minus a, zero. In other words, if I have like plus two, that's actually gonna move it two to the left. So here it's moved two to the right. So if I want a translation by two zero, a itself would need to be minus two because then the translation would be minus minus two zero, which is two zero. So basically, what's the logic here? Because there was a few bits. It's saying, look, if this curve is translated by the vector two zero, it will move here and it will go through the point minus three zero. If that is the case, then the value of a that we would need here in this curve that we are sketching is minus two. So my first answer is minus two. But there's something else that could happen, isn't there? Because that's not the only point that could have been the original point at zero. So let's delete this now because the graph's gonna be horrible if not. The other point that could actually become this minus three zero is this one. Because what if this happened? It goes this way. Because then this point would hit the minus three zero. So it still would have you know, gone through the point minus three zero. But the translation is different, isn't it? Because now it's actually been translated by the vector minus three, because it's gone three to the left, zero. So if y equals f of x plus a is a translation by minus a zero, then in this case, a would equal three. So my two answers here are a is minus two and a is three. Cheeky little question, that one. Question 14, let's have a look. Town's population P is modeled by the equation P equals AB to the T. Okay, so some exponential model. A and B are constants. T is the number of years since the population was first recorded. All right. The line L, shown in figure two, illustrates the linear relationship between T and log to the base 10 of P. So not P, log of P. for The population over a period of 100 years. The line L meets the vertical axis at 0, 5 as shown, and the gradient of L is 1 over 200. Write down an equation for L. Okay, well, L is a straight line, isn't it? And obviously straight lines, you know, y equals mx plus c, for example. The thing is that we need to be careful because my y and my x are not y and x. My y in this case is actually log to the base 10 of p, isn't it? And then my x is, is t. <laughs> so it's actually kind of in that form, isn't it? And then what are the values of m and c? Well, luckily we're told m, it's one over 200. So I know that I'm gonna get this. And then the value of c, you know what? We're told the value of c as well, because we're told that it meets the vertical axis at naught five. So the y-intercept, or the log 10 p intercept, is five. So that'd be my answer. It'd be log to the base 10 of p. Equals one over 200 t plus five, sick. Find the value of a and the value of b. Okay, so what are a and b? They're the numbers in this initial model of p equals a b to the t. Now this bit of logic that I'm about to show you is super important and you really need to make sure you understand it. So if I was to take logs of both sides here, I would get log 10 p equals log 10 a b to the t. Now I want to use some log laws on the right to split it up a bit. Now I do not want you to use the power law at this point. So I don't want you to say, oh, well, I can use the power law, right, to bring this t here. 
can't do that because t is not in the power of everything here. So if I had a, b all to the power of t, then yes, I could. But this t is only on the power of the b here. So what I need to do is first of all, get rid of this a, then I can use the power law. So the first thing I'm going to do is use the addition law and just say that this is the same as log 10 of a plus log 10 of b to the t. Now I can bring the t down because it's in the power of the whole input of this logarithm. So this is log a plus t log b. Now this looks absolutely pointless, but it's not because what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the equation I have here. So log 10 of p. I'm going to write this. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to flip some numbers around. So I'm literally not going to do anything. I'm just going to, instead of write t log 10b, I'm going to write log 10b times t. Uh, log 10b times t. So I've not done anything crazy there. I've literally just flipped those around. And then I'll just write the log on the end here. And then I've got a log 10 of p. Why have I done that? Because if I was to grab this, and I was to now compare what we have here, look what we have. We know from part A that the equation of this line here that we're given is log 10p equals 1 over 200t plus 5. But we have also shown from the model that log 10 of p is equal to log 10 of b times t plus log 10 of a Right, so correct me if I'm wrong, but surely then that must mean that this thing here is equal to 1 over 200, right? The number in front of the t, and that this thing here is equal to 5. That bit of logic there, watch the video 20 times over, write it down, learn it. Because what is what have we just done? We have just shown that if we have, this is a curve, p equals ab to the t, it's a curve. Right? It's an exponential model, it curves up like that. But if instead of plotting the curve, you take logs, it actually reduces it into a linear relationship. It's a lot easier to work with, isn't it? We can you know, get the gradient of the line, all of that stuff. It's a, lot e it's a lot easier to get the gradient of a straight line than from a curve, right? So how do we get A and B now? Well, we just say this. We say, well, log 10 of B must be equal to 1 over 200 and log 10 of a must be equal to 5. Sick. So a is going to be 10 to the 5, which is a 1 with 5 zeros after it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And b is going to be 10 to the 1 over 200, which I can't do in my head. I'm sorry. I'm not going to not going to give you that one. Just just can't can't do it. So I mean, I'm tempted to leave it like this, but let's at least I mean, it doesn't really say anything. I'll keep it like that as an exact value if I ever want to use it in future calculations, but I'll give you a bit of an idea of what it is, right? So it's going to be 10 to the power of 1 over 200, which is, you know, 1.011579 dot dot dot. So, you know, if I was to 3 sig fig this, it's going to be 1.01, .01, right? So just to, just to get a bit of an idea of what the value of b is. With reference to the model, interpret the value of the constant a and the value of the constant b. So the model is the p equals ab to the t, right? So let's kind of have a think about different values of t and what that would represent in terms of p. Like, for example, so obviously t is years. So let's, let's do this. What would the value of p be for these values of t? Well, if... If t was 0, I would get a times b to the 0. But isn't b to the 0 just 1? So wouldn't that be a? So basically it's saying, what's it saying? It's saying when t is 0, in other words, the start, right? The initial population is going to be a. So surely then a is just the initial population. And it is. a is the initial population. Here. But before I write that down, let's kind of have a think about these. If t was 1, what would happen? I would get a times b to the 1. In other words, a times b, right? t was 2, I would get a times b squared, or a b squared. t was 3, I would get a b cubed. So what's going on? How do I get from one year to the next? I multiply by b, don't I? Multiply by b. 
multiply by b, multiply by b. So here's the thing, right? Like, it's kind of the ratio of, of subsequent years, isn't it? So here's the thing. If I have a population of something, imagine b was 2. That would represent the fact that I'm doubling each year, you know? Year 1, my population is this. Double it to get to year 2. Double it to get to year 3. So it's basically the proportional increase of population, isn't it? It's saying, you know, b is going to be... That is to do with what the population from year one is compared to year two or year zero. So it's going to be the increase, the proportional increase in population. So my answer here would be that A is the initial population and that B is the proportional increase of population. Another way to think of this B, right? What is the value of B? It's about 1.01. .01. So imagine my population in year one, right, is A. And then year two would be A times 1.01. .01. That corresponds to a 1% increase, doesn't it? If you think back to kind of GCSE um, percentages, if I want a 1% increase, I times it by 1.01. .01. So that's basically, B is representing the fact that my population is going up by about 1% each year. Sick. Uh, part B, I believe. Find the population. Predicted by the model when t is 100, giving your answer to the nearest 100,000. Okay, well, I've got the model, haven't I? I know that p is now equal to a, which is 1 with 5 zeros on, times b, which is this horrible thing. I'm just going to keep it as... I'll keep it as the... Um, as I said, I would keep it as the exact answer here, because this hasn't been rounded yet. So that's the value of b. And then to the t, right? So it's just saying, well, what is this? What is this population when t is 100? You just put 100 in there. Easy as, right? So, I mean, I can put this into my calculator. I can also be a bit clever there because I can just multiply these. So this is going to be this number here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then this is going to be 10 to the 100 times 1 over 200, which is 100 over 200, which is a half, which is quite nice. <laughs> but either way, I'm using my calculator anyway, but essentially it's going to be 1 with 5 zeros, that's 4, times 10 to the power of a half, which is 316227.766. Right, and what is it saying? It is saying that the town's population is more by the equation this, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so P is just represented, represents the population. It's not in thousands or anything. And then it says, giving your answer to the nearest 100,000. So this number is what? This is 316,227. So to the nearest 100,000, this would be 300,000. <laughs> 300, what am I doing? Yeah, 300,000 is that. I, I keep losing the plot here. Yeah, that's right. So many zeros, my head is gone. So yeah, to the nearest 100,000 is 300,000. Sick. Uh, the number of years it takes the population to reach 200,000. So we do exactly the same thing here, but the unknown's in a different place, isn't it? So it's basically saying population is 200,000 to three, so many zeros, man, is going to be equal to A, which is this, to three, times by B, which is that, but I'm going to write B for now because I can't be bothered writing that so many times, to the D. Okay, well, what do we do now? I just need two, divide by this, well, that's 200,000, that's 100,000. So dividing that, I'll literally get 2. So I'll get 2 equals b to the t. Sick. So now I can take whatever log I want here. Um, I can take log b, but let's just do log 10 just to show you what's going on. I'm just going to write log for that. So I'm going to get log 2 equals log of b to the t, which equals t log b. And then to get the value of t, I am going to do log 2 divided by log b. And at this point, what I'm going to do is I am going to, well, put the value of b in, which is that 10 to the 1 over 200, right? And then, yeah, go into my calculator. So just go log. Doesn't matter what base you use, as long as you use the same base. Uh, log 2 divided by log 2 of 10 to the power of 1 over 200. And this gets me 60.2059 dot, 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 dot. Let's just see if they give me any, you know, 
specific form that they want the question in. Find the number of years, so no. So I'm just gonna go, why don't we go three sig fig here? So that's gonna be what, 60.2 years. Cool, fantastic. What next? We have part E, state two reasons why this may not be a realistic population model. All right, so this is where you kind of think outside of the maths box and you just gotta think about like what this is actually saying and what implications this would have like in real life. So, I mean, the first thing is, this whole relationship is over 100 years, right? And it's basically saying that we have this kind of steady, you know, increase in 100 years. But how realistic is that, right? Like, I don't want to, I don't want to start sounding morbid or anything, but if you think of, like, an 100-year period in history, even the last 100 years, like, has anything happened that may um, suggest that, the curve isn't going to be so smooth, Like right? Any event, for example, that might have caused a bit of a kink in, a, you know, a population growth. Well, what about, like, World War II? It's a pretty big event that I'm sure took quite a few lives. And I'm sure, you know, if there was some steady increase and in nice kind of curve in population, it might have done something to it. Does that make sense? So... You know, you can have a model and you can maybe get this model to fit a certain period in history, right? But then things happen. Big events happen. Um, you know, dinosaurs, right? <laughs> Their population was doing something and then something happened and they got extinct. They got wiped out, right? So here's the thing. Over a period of 100 years, it's quite likely that something's going to happen. There might be a pandemic. There might be a war etc etc so that's the first reason that i would probably say this is unrealistic you know in a hundred years you know you would likely uh, you would be likely to have some event you know that drastically affects the population you know to be a bit morbid about it sorry about that a war or a pandemic for example uh and i, and I need another don't i so the other thing, and this happens loads of times with these models in A-level maths, there's no end to them, is there? At no point does this say, oh, and at T is 200, something happens. It's just like, it just keeps going forever. So basically, this is saying that this population is just going to go up forever to infinity, essentially. Where, again, it's probably not going to happen, is it? Like, a town's population. The town's probably going to get full before you can fit 10 billion people in it. You know what I mean? But this model doesn't say that. This model is perfectly happy to say, oh, it's going to take this long to hit 10 billion. You know, there's nothing there to say, oh, this is only valid up until this. So this model basically also suggests, you know, that the population will just keep growing forever without any limit. Keep growing forever without any limit, you know, to infinity, which again, I don't think is very realistic. Cool. Uh, that was probably the biggest question so far, wasn't it? But yeah. That'll do for 14. 15, what we got? The curve C1 shown in figure three has equation 4x squared minus 6x plus four is equal to y. The point P lies on C1, okay, this quadratic. The curve C2, also shown in this figure, has equation y equals a half x plus ln of two x, right? And it looks like they're not intersecting. The normal to C1 at the point P meets C2 at the point Q, find these coordinates of Q. All right, it's gonna get a bit dense. So get ready, man. Get ready. Might, 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 be, might be over a few minutes. So, you know, it's, it's algebra time. Okay. It's talking about points of intersection, which is instantly making me think simultaneous equations. So, you know, it's talking about the normal to C1. So some normal equation intersecting with C2. So we know the equation of C2. It's y equals a half x plus ln of 2x. But we don't know the equation of the normal yet, do we? So what we're going to do is we're going to need to get the equation of the normal and then solve it simultaneously with this. And then that's going to be your answer. Okay, how do I get the equation of the normal? <laughs> oh, there's so much to do. So, okay, I'm going to need two things. First of all, I'm going to need its gradient. And then second of all, I'm going to need some point that it goes through. When I have those two things, I can get the equation of a straight line. Do I have its gradient? No, but I know how. Because 
if I was to differentiate this curve C1, I can get the gradient at any point. And then I can, I can use the fact that a normal is perpendicular to that curve at that point. I can get it from there. D rod by dx. This is why you are getting eight marks for this. I'm going to differentiate this curve. We know how to do this. So it's going to be 8x minus 6. It's the normal at p. So at p, the value of this, so the value of the gradient at p is going to be 8 multiplied, and then the x-coordinate of p is a half. So I'm going to sub that in. This is going to be 4 minus 6, which is minus 2. The gradient of a normal is minus 1 over this because a normal is perpendicular to the curve. And perpendicular gradients have a product of minus 1. Therefore, my value of m is going to be minus 1 divided by minus 2, which is a half. I've got my m, it's a half. And I've also got my x1, y1, because the normal does go through the point p. So this is a half 2. So I can now use these two pieces of information to get the equation of the normal. So the equation of the normal is therefore y minus 2 equals m, so a half, times x minus x1, which is a half. Sick. I'm going to sort this out a bit. So I'm going to, oh, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? Let's, let's keep the y, let's keep the y like that, okay? So I'm going to, I'm going to multiply this out. I'm going to get a half x minus a quarter. And then I'm going to add 2 from both, to both sides to get y equals a half x plus 2 minus a quarter. Use your calculator. That's fine. Um, I mean, 2 is going to be what? It's going to be 8 over 4. So I've got 7 over 4 here. But again, use calculator for that. Don't do it in your head. Okay. Ugh. So that's the equation of the normal. And I now need to solve this simultaneously with this equation, which is y equals a half x plus ln of 2x. Ooh, this is quite nice though, isn't it? Because look what's going to happen. If this was equation 1 and this was equation 2, why don't I do something mad? <laughs> why don't I do equation 2 minus equation 1? Okay, what would I have on the left-hand side? I would have y minus y. What would I have on the right-hand side? I would have a half x plus ln of 2x and then minus a half x plus 7 over 4. Well, this is nice because they cancel. This half x cancels with this half x. So I'm actually just left with 0 is ln of 2x minus 7 over 4. Adding 7 over 4 to both sides, I get 7 over 4 equals ln of 2x. Now remember, ln is log to the base e. Therefore, if I do e to the power of both sides, I would get this. e is going to cancel out with the ln, that's the definition. Divide by 2, and I'm going to get x equals a half e to the 7 over 4. Sick. One more thing to do. I need to sub it in to get y, and I can use whatever I want here. So why don't I use this one, because it looks nicer. So y is a half x plus 7 over 4 equals a half x, which is now this, plus 7 over 4. God, this is mad, isn't it? And I think I'm there. So let's just simplify this slightly. That's going to be a quarter e to the 7 over 4 plus 7 over 4. So the coordinates are going to be a half e to the 7 over 4 and a quarter e to the 7 over 4 plus 7 over 4. Do not Put that into your calculator, because this, as grim as it looks, is exact. It's perfect. It's exact. I've not got any rounding errors, nothing. If I was to put this into my calculator, I'm losing accuracy. I'm rounding. And that's why they specifically say find the exact coordinates of Q. There they are. 16, we're getting there. <laughs> Figure 4 shows the plan view of the design for a swimming pool. Shape of the pool consists of a rectangular section joined to a semicircular section as shown in diagram. Given that AE is 2x, ED is y, and the area is 2 fitty, show that the perimeter is given by all of that. Okay, let's get the diagram up here. So key thing about this perimeter that they've given is it's just in terms of x. So this is a very common 
kind of a come and think, <laughs> come and think that they like to do. And it's basically saying, yeah, I can get the perimeter in terms of x and y, but it would be really nice if it was just in terms of x because then I can, you know, differentiate and do all of that stuff. So how are we going to, first of all, get a relationship between x and y? We're going to use the information that they have given us. We know that the total area is too fitting, meaning that this plus this, the areas, is going to be equal to 250. So what's the area of this bit? Well, it's going to be 2xy because it's a nice rectangle. And then this is a semicircle, the radius of which is x because, you know, this whole thing is 2x. So this is x. So if this was a circle, its area would be pi x squared, but it's a semicircle. So its area is pi x squared over 2. So this thing here, plus the 2xy, we know is equal to 250. So what I actually want to do is I want to rearrange this for y, because I'm eventually going to substitute that y into the perimeter. So if I was to take this over to the other side, I would get 2xy equals 250 minus pi x squared over 2. I can then divide by 2x. So I'm going to get y equals 250 over 2x minus pi x squared over 2 times 2x. So let's simplify a bit first. I know that 250 over 2 is 125, right? So I got 125, still got an x on the bottom. x squared over x, well, there, one of those are going to cancel. So I'm going to get a pi x on top, and then I've got a 2 times 2, which is 4. Sick. Okay. I still need to work at the perimeter, so let's go back here. My perimeter is going to be hot. It's going to be this plus this plus this plus this. So this thing is 2x. This thing is y. And then I've got another y there, so there's going to be 2y. And then what's this? Well, what's the circumference of this whole circle? The circumference is 2 pi r or 2 pi x, right? So I get a 2 pi x if that was a whole circle, but it's a semicircle. So I only have half of it. So instead of 2 pi x, I have pi x. Meaning that if I was to grab all of this here and hopefully sub my new y into it, I'm going to get what they want, okay? So, let's have a look. Can I do anything, first of all? Well, I know I've got my x's here. Let's sub this y in and just see what we get, okay? So I'm going to get 2x plus 2 and then all of this stuff. So 1, 2, 5 over x minus pi x over 4 and then plus a pi x. Okay, let's multiply out see what I get. I get 2x plus 250 over x minus, this is now going to be a pi x over 2, right, 4 and the 2, plus a pi x. And then I've got two pi x terms, haven't I? I've got pi x minus pi x over 2, so pi x minus a half pi x, meaning that I've got a half pi x left. So I've got 2x plus a half pi x plus 250 over x. Is that what they have? They have 2x, sick plus 250 over x, plus a half pi x, yeah. So they've just written it like this, but that is what they have. So we're good, <laughs> sick. Okay, explain why. Ooh, okay. Well, we know why x has to be greater than zero because x is a distance, right? So a distance obviously has to be greater than zero. So it's greater than zero, we know that. How are we going to get the other one, though? Well, you can see where we can get natural inequalities, right? It's from the fact that this has to be a distance. So you go, oh, well, it has to be greater than zero. Can we do that anywhere else? I think we can, because look, I know what y is. So I know that y also has to be greater than zero. So, I mean, I just, I just copy and paste this bit of logic here, change it to a y, and then hopefully I can get something coming out of that. Because I know that y is equal to 125 over x minus pi x over 4. So if I grab this 
and say that this must be greater than zero, hopefully I can get that other condition. So take this over to the other side. So I'm going to get 1, 2, 5 over x is greater than pi x over 4. Multiply by x, which I'm allowed to do because I know that x is greater than 0. So don't you be going on about me about mm, negative and an inequality and to flip the sign. No, you don't, mate. So it's 1, 2, 5 is greater than pi x squared over 4. Get this stuff over to the other side. So I'm going to multiply by 4 to get 500 is greater than pi x squared. Divide by pi to get 500 over pi is greater than x squared, and then I'm going to square root. So I know that x has to be less than the square root of 500 over pi. Is that what they have? Yes. So I know that x has to be a greater than 0 and b less than 500 over pi. Therefore, that's the case. Cool. Find the minimum perimeter of the pool, giving your answer to three significant figures. Okay, so it's saying, look, given a certain area of this pool, what is the smallest perimeter you can make? Okay, so it's going to be to do with differentiation because a minimum is a, is a stationary point. So to get stationary points, I need to differentiate and set it to zero. So if I add dp by dx here, what am I going to get? Well, first of all, let's rewrite p. I just want to write it in terms of its powers because that's kind of what you need for differentiation. So it's 2x plus 250x to the minus 1 and then plus pi by 2x. Okay, so dp by dx is going to be a lot easier now. It's going to be 2 minus 250x to the minus 2 plus pi by 2. And now I want to set this equal to 0 to find stationary points. So I'm going to take this over to the other side, and I'm going to get 250. x to the minus 2 is basically the same as dividing by x squared. This is going to equal 2 plus pi by 2. Okay, so to get x squared here, why don't I multiply by x squared and divide by all of this stuff? So I'm going to get 250 divided by 2 plus pi by 2 is equal to x squared. So x is going to equal the square root of all of this stuff here, grim times. So what else do we need to do? We need to now, well, we've not actually got the perimeter yet, do we? Now, okay, I can work this out for x. I don't really care about it, to be honest. What I think I'm going to do is I'm just going to get it in my calculator and store it as an answer. So I'm just going to write square root. I'm not even going to write it down, I don't care, of 250 over 2 plus pi by 2. Because this is obviously going to be this horrible thing that needs rounding. But what I have done by this is it's stored as ants in my calculator. So I'm not having to worry about rounding, guys. So this is the value of x which minimizes the perimeter. Therefore, the minimum value of p, I just need to sub this value of x into p, don't I? So it's going to be 2 times this x. I'm just going to write x min. I'm not writing this out a million times. So 2 times x min plus 2 fiddy over x min plus pi x min over 2. And now what I can do, because I've got x min in my calculator, is just write 2 ants plus 250 over ants plus pi times ants over 2, which is going to get me 59.756 dot 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 dot, which to 3 sig fig is 59.8, and that's meters to 3 significant figures. Last question, this is it. A circle C with center at minus 2, 6 passes through the point 10, 11. Show that the circle C also passes through the point 10, 1. Okay, uh, probably a few ways to do this. I think I would like to get the equation of the circle. Why not? So the equation of any circle is in this form. Okay, where AB is the center and R is the radius. We, we know the center. <laughs> we know that the center is minus 2, 6, meaning that this is the case. We don't know the radius yet though, do we? But if you think about it, for a circle, if it passes through a point 
and we know the center point, then the distance between those two points is always going to be the radius of the circle, isn't it? So to get the distance between two points, what we need to do is a bit of Pythagoras. So we need to do the difference between the x coordinates, the difference between the y coordinates, they're going to form a triangle. So super quickly, this would basically be the square root of the difference in these y coordinates. So it's going to be 11 minus 6, all of that squared. The difference in the x coordinates. So 10 minus minus 2, all squared. So this is going to be what? 11 minus 6 is 5, so it's going to be 5 squared. Plus, uh, that's going to be 12 squared. So 12 squared. Now, I'm a nerd, so I actually happen to know that this is 13. Cool. Therefore, the equation of my circle is x plus 2 squared plus y minus 6 squared equals 13 squared. So I can either write 13 squared or I can write 169. It's up to you. I'm going to keep it as 13 squared. Cool. What do I actually need to show here? I need to show that it passes through this point. But now I've got the equation. It's super simple because if I can show that when I sub in 10 and 1 for x and y, it satisfies the equation, then I'm good. So let's do it. So let's see what happens when I have 10 and 1. The left hand side is going to equal what? It's going to equal 10 plus 2 squared plus 1 minus 6 squared, which is equal to 12 squared plus minus 5 squared, which is equal to 144 plus 25, which is 169, which is 13 squared, which is the right hand side. So we've shown that it's satisfied, therefore it must lie on the circle. Cool. The tangent to the circle at the point 10, 11 meets the y-axis at the point P. And the tangent to the circle C at 10, 1 ugh, meets the y-axis at the point Q. Show that the distance P, Q is 58. Finishing off with a bang, aren't they? All right. Uh, it's tough, isn't it? It's great. There's a lot of information. Draw a diagram, man. Just draw a diagram. I always say this. We've got a circle. <laughs> We've got a circle. We know the centre of the circle is at minus 2, 6. And we also know that the radius of this thing is 13. So where would my axes be? They would kind of be like, you know, my axes are going to be blue because I'm, I'm going rogue here. Well, this is minus 2, so the y-axis is definitely going to be on this side. And then this is 6 over 6 upwards, but the radius is 13, so the radius is going to go underneath here. So I reckon it's going to look something like this. Sick. Okay. Now, this is the y and this is the x. I'm going rogue. So it says the tangent to the circle at the point 10, 11. So that's going to be somewhere. They're both positive right over here. So why don't I draw this tangent? It's going to look like that. Okay. And it's saying that this tangent meets the y-axis at the point P. So this here is going to be the point P. Uh, and the tangent to the circle C at the point 10, 1, it's the y-axis at the point Q. Okay. Well, this is the point 10, 1. Sorry, 10, 11. Point 10, 1 is an interesting one because it has the same x-coordinate. So the point 10, 1 is actually directly under the point 10, 11. And that's useful because we're going to use some symmetries here. Okay, so if I was to draw this tangent, which is maybe going to be something like that. Oh, let's rotate him a bit. It's very hard to do. Oh, I just, I just can't do it. There we go. There we go. Got it. Um, there. This is going to be symmetrical, right? Meaning that. So I kind of want this point here, which is, which is Q. But. The midpoint between these, because of this symmetry and these being on the same 10, 1, uh, so that's, okay, 10, 1 should be above this axis, but so, you know, it doesn't really matter. Essentially, it would be, be drawn here instead. I just did it underneath that. It just so happens. But don't worry about that. <laughs> that doesn't affect the math at all, trust me. 
basically the midpoint of this is just going to be the line of the center because of how because of the symmetry of this circle right so if i work out the point p i know that this here the y coordinate here is six and i can just double this distance to get that okay so let's first of all get p how am i going to do it i'm going to need the equation of this tangent so there's a couple of things i need the first thing i want is the gradient and the way i'm going to do that is using the fact that a tangent is always perpendicular to a radius here so if I was to get this radius, I know that it's perpendicular to this tangent. So the gradient of the radius, so the gradient of the radius, change in y by change in x. So I'm going to do 11 minus 6 over 10 minus minus 2, which is what? That's going to be 5 over 12. Therefore, the gradient of the tangent is going to be minus 1 divided by that. In other words, it's going to be minus 12 over 5. Therefore, the equation of the tangent is going to be y minus y1. And then remember, this is at the point 10, 11. So it's going to be y minus 11 equals m x minus x1, so x minus 10. To find where this hits the y-axis, I need to sub in x equals 0. So when x equals 0, what happens? y minus 11 is going to equal minus 12 over 5 multiplied by minus 10. Okay? What's this going to be? Well, the 5 is going to cancel with the 10, so I'd get a 2. Minuses are going to cancel, so I've just got 12 times 2 here, which is 24. Add the 11 to both sides. I know this is crazy. I know this is crazy. 24 plus 11, which is 35. And I think I'm almost there. Because if I know that this is 35, that that is 6, then this distance here... What's the difference between 35 and 6? It's going to be 29. Because of the symmetries, I know that this distance here must also be 29. Therefore, if I have 29 and another 29, the difference or the distance between P and Q must be 29 multiplied by 2, which is going to be 58. Oh, I got it right. Woo! That's grim. I was getting tired towards the end of that one, I'll tell you that much. But um, honestly, these past papers are so, so, so useful for year 12s. Get this down as soon as you can. And then in year 13, it's all going to make a bit more sense. Anyway, I will see you in the next one for a bit of Applied.